Even if it takes, even if it's like five years later and you're still feeling like, where the fuck, like when I'm waiting for this shit to heal, like it's nothing's happening. It's gonna take another, you know, a few years, you know what I mean? That shit does take time in some situations, but you know, it will eventually get better. Things will get better. And also you have to be grateful for what you have. Never be ungrateful. It's when people start to be super, you know, like, oh, I hate my life, everything sucks. But it's like you got shoes in your feet right now, you know what I mean? There's kids who don't have water, access to water in the world. So pretty much, yeah. There's people fighting to survive, so. Live on for them, you know what I mean? Live the life that they wish they could live. Gustav Laja here, otherwise known as Lil Peep, was a Swedish-American rapper, singer, and songwriter. Born on Halloween night of 1996, Lil Peep, or Gus, was a pioneer in helping revive an emo style of rap and rock in the late 2010s. His life was tragic, littered with mental health problems and drug use, but he carved a legacy through his music, being named what could have been this generation's Kurt Cobain. Today I break down the life story and legacy of Gus, otherwise known as Lil Peep. Born in Allentown, Pennsylvania, before his fifth birthday, he moved to Long Beach, New York, where he was raised along with his brother, Oscar. Both of Gus's parents were Harvard graduates. His mom, Lizza Walmack, was a first grade teacher, while his dad, Carl Joan R., was a college professor. Gus took dance classes until he was seven years old, later on taking hip-hop classes. He quit the dance classes as a kid as he recalled how the girls would always tease him for being the only boy. Gus was actually placed in his elementary school's gifted and talented program when he was in third grade. He expressed an interest in music and fashion from an early age, playing the trombone and tuba. By the time Gus started attending middle school, however, he started to feel as if he didn't fit in. He was described in school to have a few close friends, although he mostly stuck to himself. Not to mention Gus wasn't the best student, as in middle school his grades started to slip. Tenth grade is when things started to go south for Gus, as his parents separated, with his father leaving the home. This made his antisocial behavior even worse. He was a self-described loner who made most of his friends online. In high school, he started getting tattoos and smoking weed, further alienating himself from his peers. At 17, he got his first face tattoo, which would be a broken heart by his left eye. Getting face tattoos motivated him to go harder with his music, as he knew it would make it harder for him to get a regular job. Near the end of high school, he started becoming intolerable towards school. It got so bad to the point where he would hop a 20-foot fence nearly every day to escape if he won. Eventually, he dropped out as he couldn't take being in a classroom anymore. He started to focus more intently on his music. Gus got a job at a seafood restaurant shortly after dropping out, but only quit after a short amount of time as he didn't like cutting the faces off of crabs. With that being said, this was the introduction to his music career. Gus was initially inspired by underground acts such as Sesh Hollow Water Boys and I Love McKinnon. In high school, he started writing his own raps, and if you were close enough with him, you would freestyle sometimes. Peep's first ever song was Down 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 along with Latitude in 2014, which was released under the synonym Trap Goose. Peep finished high school on an online program that required only one essay a week, which he admits his mom usually finished. Gus's childhood friend, Brendan Savage, was living in San Francisco at the time, and invited him to stay at his house over the summer of 2014 while his parents were gone. Gus traveled all the way to California to stay with Brendan, but as soon as the summer ended, Brendan started looking at colleges for the fall semester. Gus wanted to stay in California, however. Brendan and Gus would go house hunting, and they found a house on 1700 University Drive on Pasadena. Gus stayed in school there for a few weeks, attending Glendale Community College. The rent cost $1,600 a month, but it got increasingly harder for Gus to make up his $800 portion of the rent. He initially lived in Skid Row and dipped in and out of homelessness. He would stay in an apartment with Brendan while he was pursuing his degree until he dropped out and the two eventually went separate ways. Pete moved back to Long Island with his mom on February 1st, 2016. He had been living on mostly canned food and clothes that his mom would send him. Back home, however, he would pour his emotions more into his music. In 2015, Peep released his first extended play, Feels. This is followed by his debut mixtape, Lil Peep Part 1, which generated 4,000 plays in his first week. Shortly thereafter, he released a follow-up mixtape, Live Forever, which had one of his most streamed songs, Nuts. It's important to note the quality of his earlier music as well. It was clear Lil Peep had a natural talent as a musician. One of his first tracks under the synonym Lil Peep was Star Shopping in 2015. The track was his first to reach 1,000 plays, and got a lot of positive reception. Years later, it being one of his most well-known songs, now having over 700 million streams on Spotify. During Gus's only full-time semester at Nesu Community College, he actually made it to the Dean's List. However, instead of enrolling in a second term, he decided to drop out and began performing a schema posse. 
PMAT Atlanta rapper and producer Jay Green, Florida rapper Ghostman, and Houston rapper Craig Zen living with them while forming the collective Schema Posse. Peep was invited to Schema Posse by Ghostman when he heard his music. He originally met Craig Zen online and was introduced to Jay Green who needed a singer. By the end of 2015, he had already completed a large body of work in his bedroom while attending school full time. In 2016, he was motivated to move back to LA and move back with Brendan Pasadena. He also invited other artists to help cover the living expenses. The house then became a hub for like-minded creatives. His popularity started to grow when he released the song Beamer Boy, which led to him performing with Schema Posse for the first time in February 2016. However, in April of that year, Schema Posse broke up. In August of that year, First Access Entertainment signed Lil Peep on a joint venture to invest in his career. Now that Peep was no longer part of a collective, one of Peep's producers, Ned Arb, started introducing him to artists a part of his collective. That collective would be a goth boy clique, which is where he met Lil Tracy. Ned Arb brought Lil Tracy over, and the two instantly became best friends, shooting a music video for White Tee in the same day. However, it stuck and became a staple for the aesthetic of many of Peep's music videos. Both Lil Peep and Lil Tracy would start making music together, making the EPs Castle 1 and Castle 2, which contained some of the duo's biggest songs like Witch Blades, White Wine, and Your Favorite Dress. In 2016, Lil Peep and most of Goth Boy Click moved out of the Pasadena house they were staying at and into the loft in the heart of downtown LA. The loft homed over 10 artists at one time and became a creative space, much like the Pasadena house. Lil Peep became a member of Goth Boy Click officially on September 16th via a tweet. With the tweet came the announcement of his project Hellboy, which released September 25th, 2016. Now that Lil Peep had signed with First Access Entertainment, he released his debut album Come Over When You're Sober Part 1 on August 15th, 2017. The album was recorded in London along with Come Over When You're Sober Part 2, which would be released posthumously. Peep had immigrated to London during a dismantlement with Goth Boy Click and would be associated with I Love McKinnon and his longtime friend, British rapper Bexy. The two would collaborate on multiple songs together as well as an EP. The project contained multiple hits such as Ben's Truck, Save That Shit, and Awful Things, with best friend and frequent collaborator Lil Tracy being the only feature on the project. Tracks such as these would propel his popularity and include him in the SoundCloud conversation of that time. Unfortunately, his debut would be the last project he would release while he was alive. Exactly three months after the project's release, Peep was on his first world tour which started in the UK in September 2017, moving to Germany before finishing the United States in November. However, it was cut short by his death. Apparently Peep's at the back of the bus doing press-ups, sit-ups, working on his six-pack, his muscles. I'm gonna see for myself. My brother just died in my arms, man. I'm done with this shit, man. Forever. Fuck this shit. It's important to note that Peep was battling with intense anxiety and drug addiction throughout his entire career. This would typically lead to him taking Xanax before many of his performances. Some people accuse him of glorifying depression and drug abuse when, in fact, it's quite the opposite. His fans could relate to the themes of mental health and drug abuse he talked about in his music and could empathize with his pain. Unfortunately, this is also the thing that led to his demise. On November 15th, 2017, Peep was found and pronounced dead at the back of his tour bus. An Instagram post hours before his death, Peep claimed to have ingested psilocybin mushrooms and cannabis concentrate. In another, he claimed to have consumed six pills of Xanax following a video of him dropping an unidentified pill into his mouth and shaking a full prescription bottle. The post was captioned, When I die, you'll love me. His death was believed to be an overdose caused by a mixture of Xanax and fentanyl. Days after his death, there was a police report that revealed that Lil Peep had taken a nap around 5.45 before his concert. His manager checked on him twice to find him sleeping and breathing fine, but was unable to wake him up. The third time he checked on him, he wasn't breathing. Peep's manager would perform CPR before medics arrived, where he would be pronounced dead at the scene. New York Times music critic John Karamenica proclaimed, at the time of Lil Peep's death, he was at the cusp of something significant. Three months earlier, he had released Come Over When You're Sober Part 1, the album that took the skeleton sound he developed in his bedroom, Emo Sentimentality, Thunderous Hip Hop Underbelly, and Rockstar and Sentience, and thickened it up. His mixtapes Hellboy and Crybaby released on SoundCloud were on the front lines of hip-hop's open-eared engagement with other genres, as well as documents of the ways emo and pop punk had begun to make room for hip-hop. He was at the musical Vanguard and covered in a symphony of tattoos, an emerging fashion icon as well. 
Lil Peep had been an inspiration for outcasts and youth subcultures drawn from the internet. For the kids struggling with mental health, drug abuse, or the kids that felt as if they didn't belong or fit in. He was a pioneer of the emo style of rap in the late 2010s and had been described as what could have been this generation's Kurt Cobain. He died just after his 21st birthday and was an artist who opened the conversation for mental health and drug use through his music. His popularity exploded after his death, propelling him and his music more and more into the mainstream eye. Although he had a short career, Peep's legacy will live on through his music, as well as the millions of people he helped heal through his own pain.